I'm Julia Manchester. What's America thinking? That's the question we're asking here every week. Let's dive in into what has many people on edge right now, from terror attacks to ongoing wars to issues with our own border. Tensions are rising and foreign policy is quickly becoming a major concern for Americans. I think it's the Middle East and Israel and Gaza. It's just one of those things that's continuing to drive a, a stake in between the, the right and the left and, and whose side you're on. Just, uh, just another thing that's causing that divide. It's a exceedingly dangerous time as far as I'm concerned. A war, destruction, inflation. <laughs> There's good things can generate jobs uh, in certain industries, but uh, at the expense of what? The biggest thing going on right now, in my opinion, is the human sex trafficking that's going all over the world. You know, the United States has been a major power for over 50 years, but it seems like it is shifting. There's a lot of other uh, countries that are coming into the picture. We can't just flex muscle anymore. Americans are clearly passionate about how our policies influence the world, and politicians have taken notice. Generally divided along party lines, solutions to foreign conflicts are increasingly being pitched to boost support in upcoming elections. I hope I'm not right about World War III, because you're very close to World War III. That bill were the law today, I'd shut down the border right now and fix it quickly. We know that American troops are at risk around the world because of Joe Biden's weak global leadership, that foreign adversaries like Iran fear no reprisal for taking American lives. National security supplemental that the president put forth uh, back in, in the fall is incredibly important. It is an emergency request. The world is on fire, literally. You've got a war in Europe. You've got a war in the Middle East. We need to ensure Putin continues to fail in Ukraine and Ukraine to succeed. And the best way for that to, to do that is to pass the supplement. Joining me now is Ian Lesser, vice president of the German Marshall Fund, a nonpartisan think tank. Ian, thank you so much for joining us today. Very good to be with you, Julia. Wonderful. Well, just to jump into it, a recent AP NORC poll asked Americans what they most want the government working on. The results show a significant rise in foreign policy, jumping from 18% in 2023 to 38% going into 2024. You know, I cover voters and elections, and, you know, it's not often when I hear about foreign policy impacting voters at the ballot box. So why do you think there's been such a spike in this? Well, it's simply what's happening in the world. And some of the, you know, the comments in your intro section reflect this. People are aware there's a crisis in the Middle East. There's conflict. There's a war in Europe. Uh, you didn't talk about that yet, but there's a, a, a looming strategic competition with China, which affects all sorts of things, not just our security, but also our prosperity. Um, the border. Uh, not strictly maybe a foreign policy question, but it's part of um, the equation when people look abroad. And there are so many of these issues that uh, are neither really foreign policy or domestic policy. There's something of both. And people are aware of that, and it's making them anxious. And I think that drives some of what you're seeing. You know, we've heard Trump and, you know, some other candidates in the past talk about China and that, um, you know, competition between Washington and Beijing and wanting the U.S. to come out on top. But historically, has foreign policy influenced the way Americans vote? Well, the short answer is no. Uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, even at a time, times of war, I mean, it thinks back to the, the Vietnam War period and other times when foreign policy was, in a sense, very divisive as a policy issue. Um, Elections at the national level, certainly at the state level, weren't really driven by that. I mean, it was a commonplace to say that foreign policy doesn't decide American elections. That's probably, in a sense, still true. But I wonder, and it's worth thinking about, whether in a very close election year, in a very polarized environment, with a lot of anxiety, whether perhaps that's not changing and where it's very critical to get out the vote for certain candidates, uh, for Joe Biden, for others. Uh, the, one can think about, you know, progressives in his party uh, who are very, very alienated by some aspects of his foreign policy. They're not necessarily going to go out and vote for Trump if that's the matchup. But um, will they come out to vote? Or are people going to be turned off because of some aspect of foreign policy? So, you know, maybe this is a year when the traditional behavior doesn't hold. 
And multiple global conflicts have erupted, Ukraine, Russia, Israel, Hamas, China, Taiwan. To what degree do you think all of these conflicts can sway voters ultimately? I think they have a kind of additive effect because, you know, there is a sense of anxiety, I think, in the country. And it's sensed abroad, by the way, among people who watch the United States closely. Um, it's driven by many things, maybe not primarily foreign policy. Maybe it's about the economy. Maybe it's about cultural and social issues. That's for sure. Uh, but at the margins, in a very close race, some of these issues can really make a difference. Uh, the administration's policy vis-a-vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis foreign aid, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China or the Middle East. All of these things can make a difference for certain voters. Maybe they won't be, you know, they're, it's not gonna, they're not going to switch their vote because of it, but they may turn off certain voters. They stay at home. And, uh, and it's also a space in which there is a lot of scope for misrepresentation. Uh, you know, there is a lot of rhetoric in the campaign trail that Europe isn't doing its part uh, in terms of supporting Ukraine. In fact, they've given twice as much assistance in terms of monetary value to Ukraine, Ukraine than the United States has. Um, you don't hear that very much. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a space where people can easily become emotive, but right. don't necessarily have access to good information. And zeroing in on the war in the Middle East, three U.S. troops were killed in Jordan earlier this month. That's the first time we've seen U.S. casualties since the October 7th attacks on Israel. Do those casualties change how Americans view war and foreign policy going forward? Well, you know, I do think for uh, for the society as a whole, for the average voter who doesn't necessarily foreign, follow foreign policy every day, you know, when Americans are killed, it concentrates minds, understandably, yeah. rightly so. Um, there's also a prospect of uh, further terrorism that comes about as a result of what's happening in the Middle East that could affect Americans in different ways. And so, yes, I think it does, it sort of brings the issue home to people in a way that, you know, the average newspaper story every day may not. And, um, and it does concentrate minds and it becomes a, a sort of, um, you know, a key talking point on the campaign trail of, you know, how tough the United States is going to be, for example, with Iran. Uh, Iran is, uh, backs many of these groups that are seeking to attack American forces and American assets in the Middle East. Um, you know, what's the response? What's the response from the administration that obviously doesn't want to see escalation, but also wants to make a proper response to a very vicious attack on the United States? So, you know, the, the, there's a lot at stake and, and it's not a, a normal uh, sort of year. It's a very polarized environment and uh, candidates will make a lot out of these issues if they wish to. And Ian, you know, I've been following President Biden a bit on the campaign trail, and oftentimes when you see him give, um, you know, speeches not necessarily related to the war in the Middle East, there are a lot of uh, protesters calling for a ceasefire that interrupt the president. Um, you know, sometimes we see these hecklers and sort of brush them off as a one-off event, but this keeps happening with him, and it keeps happening with other politicians. So are you seeing a disconnect between younger Americans' worldviews and our governments on foreign policy, because we obviously know that a lot of younger Americans tend to be on the pro ceasefire side of things versus the government. You know, I do think there are, there are some differences um, that are making themselves felt. I think younger people, especially you know younger progressives, the Democratic Party, um, have been um, you know have have seen something in what's happening now in our policy towards Israel. Uh, where they just simply disagree. I mean, that may not, that may be a variance with most of the view inside the Democratic Party and even in the country, but it can make a difference in a close, in a close race. And, I, and I'm sure the Biden campaign will have to respond to that. Um, there are other things. Um, younger people are more focused on Asia than Europe. Uh, there's been a lot of polling about that over the years. Um, and so they, they tend to be very focused on things that have to do with Asia, whether it's good or bad. It could be, uh, you know, a, a booming relationship with India, or it could be concerned about China. It could be about jobs. It could be about security. It could be about tech, different sorts of things. So there's, there are different focuses. And um, I think in different ways, both Trump and Biden have talked about this in a broader sense. I mean, Biden, obviously, in a much edgier, sharper way and in a much more nationalistic way. But when the Biden administration talks about a foreign policy for the middle class, 
you know, they're responding to some of those same anxieties. And turning to former President Trump, he's gone as far to say that we could be heading into World War III. Should we really be that concerned that we're heading into another global conflict? I, I think that's an exaggeration. Um, it does reflect, of course, some reality. The reality is that we have multiple conflicts around the world with multiple potentials for escalation that could engage the United States much more directly. Um, and some of these some of these potential conflicts um, will be affected simply by the possibility for something to go wrong. Right. We may not want escalation. The Chinese may not want escalation, say, over Taiwan or in the South China Sea. Uh, this could happen with Russia in the Baltic or in the Black Sea. Uh, I, the, you know, neither side probably wants that kind of an escalation. But things simply go wrong and can get out of control. And it's amazing how quickly things can fall apart. I mean, people sometimes talk about the First World War and the sort of uh, sleepwalking into conflict. Uh, that was a conflict in which the world basically went from a very stable environment to chaos in the period of weeks. And that was at a time when things didn't move as fast as they do today. Right, right. Well, like you said, it only takes one to a few events to really change the course the world is on. Ian, thank you so much for joining us here today. Very good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. With just one week to the Nevada Republican caucus, Trump is already celebrating as he is all but guaranteed a victory. I didn't know she was still campaigning. She said, she's still campaigning? And she didn't come to Nevada because they looked at a poll and I was at 97 percent. She said, I think we're not going to win Nevada. Haley decided to skip the contest, instead pouring all of her effort into South Carolina, where she trails Trump by over 30 percent. But let me tell you, when we got off the plane this morning, <laughs> it's a great day in South Carolina. The former U.N. ambassador and South Carolina governor is the only remaining major GOP candidate fighting to topple Trump and become the Republican presidential nominee. It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, director of data science from Decision Desk HQ. Scott, thank you so much for joining us as always. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so just to dive right into it, a recent poll shows 67% of Americans feel they pay too much in federal income tax. And these numbers may not uh, seem surprising to most, but Trump is heavily campaigning on cutting taxes. How can the current administration calm voters' concerns? Well, first off, I'd like to know the 3% who think they're too low, right? You always you always find those polls funny. What I would <laughs> say is that 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 polling is 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 pretty standard for what we see in public polling around taxes over the last 20 or 30 years. By and large, people think they're spending too much. It's interesting when you follow up with a question, um, do you, would you mind paying taxes if you thought your money was being spent better? And that's when people um, tend to soften on a little bit. And so that's where I think we line up with um, what the what the Democrats and Republicans are trying to do in the, in the Senate now with a tax bill and where Biden is trying to push, President Biden is trying to push on on, on a lot of the economy. Um, and and, and uh, really leaning into that. But yes, taxes are going to be an issue this cycle. And it's 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 going to be one of those things where, um, you know, Donald Trump and the Republicans, they're talking about it now. We'll see. We'll see what the uh, what the Democrats are able to pull out of the, the Senate and the House and how they frame it in the election cycle. Yeah, it seems standard for a lot of Republicans to really go in on taxes, you know, throughout the history of U.S. campaigns. But, you know, speaking of campaigns, Scott, Nikki Haley has started to pick up a little momentum in the past few weeks, but she's still, still trailing Trump by 30 percent in South Carolina. Does a defeat for Haley in South Carolina mean the end of the road for the Haley campaign? So, so that's a very interesting question. What I would say, the end of the road for the Haley campaign is when she runs out of money mm. to get on that plane to go to the next state. And you know, we've been reading in the Hill all this week. There's been quite a bit of fundraising activity on her part, um, both on on both coasts as well as small donor fundraising. So she's certainly going to have the money to go into South Carolina. I think she's going to have to somehow meet or beat expectations. And I don't think expectations are she's going to win South Carolina. But if she loses by more than thirty or forty. It may be, and, and she spends all her money to do that. She's not going to probably have enough money to go all the way to the Super Tuesday states. But really, it comes down to does she have that grassroots donor support to keep her going? 
Yeah, and her campaign is certainly, you know, letting reporters know that they believe they have the uh, grassroots donor support. But moving on, a new Bloomberg Morning Consult poll found that 53 percent of voters in seven battleground states would be unwilling to vote for Trump if he were found guilty of a crime. Scott, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but could this really affect Trump's chances? Uh, absolutely it could. And you know what? This is the second data point to show something similar. There's a series of New York Times Siena polls done a couple months ago that showed the same thing. Um, you know, so two data points and there will probably be some more data points as we get into the election season that corroborate that. This is definitely something Trump should be worried about. But on the flip side, a poll is a snapshot in time. Donald Trump will certainly have the opportunity to, if convicted, um, you know, campaign back and potentially win some of those uh, win some of those voters back. And that sounds kind of funny to say he'll be able to campaign back if he's convicted. But that's how it works. <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, moving on to Biden, uh, the president's approval rating uh, numbers have sat below 50 percent since August of 2021. Historically, the numbers aren't in the president's favor, with one term presidents going back to Carter, Bush and Trump all going into reelection under 50 percent approval and all losing. Is the writing on the wall for Biden's chance at a second term? It's certainly not a good data point, but we are in this new norm. The new norm over the last couple of presidential cycles is both both candidates, so to speak, not necessarily the incumbent, both candidates tend to have underwater approval ratings. Um, we saw that in 16. We saw that in 20. Um, and so it, 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 it's something that, you know, yes, over the course of 40 or 50 years, that's a bad data point. But if you look over the last couple of cycles, it is certainly possible for a Joe Biden to overcome that. Um, you know, if we just look at the stats, the economy is good. Now, the public doesn't agree with him on that, but the economy is good. If you can flip the economy and get the public to believe him on the economy or at least feel that good economy, that would be a data point that would counteract and maybe even lift up that approval rating. So we have these two very unpopular uh, candidates, uh, the front runners in their own uh, respective primaries. But we have these third party candidates really trying to gain advantage or take advantage of that. Robert F. Kennedy, Kennedy Jr. is one of them. He's hinting at looking to run as a libertarian. While he still faces huge hurdles with gaining ballot access, do you think he could build enough momentum to sway voters away from Biden? It, you know what? It's funny. The polling shows that he can sway voters away from Biden and he can sway voters away from yes. Republicans. Now, it's interesting to me on the ballot access. This is something Michael Bloomberg looked at doing and said, hey, it's going to cost a billion dollars. I'm not going to spend a billion dollars. I'm going to go take the Democratic ticket. That appears to be what RFK is doing. RFK does not have a billion dollars. Libertarians need a candidate. They already have ballot access. So if he really does get that nomination and he's on the ballot, that was, should be a worry for both cam both um, Biden and Trump's campaigns, because he does have the ability to, to take voters from both sides. And if he's got ballot access, it's going to matter. And, you know, worth mentioning that the Kennedy campaign announced today that he raised $7 million in the fourth quarter of last year. That's a big chunk of change. And if I'm a Republican or a Democrat looking at that, my eyebrows are certainly uh, raised. Moving further down the ballot, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert switched districts earlier this year, hoping to boost her chances of keeping a seat in the House. But a recent straw poll had her in fifth place. Is this a sign of hard times to come for the uh, Colorado Congresswoman? Yes. In one word, yes. <laughs> she barely won her seat last time by a few hundred votes, um, almost went to a recount. Um, it did not. Um, she's moving to a district that's completely outside where she was. The reason why she moved districts is because she read the writing on the wall in her current one. She was going to have a tough, tough uphill battle. Straw polls are not elections, but they are certainly indicators of it. And, you know, you if you were her, you'd hope you at least come in second or third. But a fifth is pretty bad. And there's a lot of good candidates in that primary who are going to have money and also have name recognition. I, I, it's not looking good for her. Yeah, we were certainly caught off guard last cycle when she, um, you know, appeared to be losing and won by a very, very narrow margin. It seems like we're, um, you know, predicting a maybe a different outcome this time. Um, but moving to the Senate, all eyes have been looming on the presidential election, but seats in the upper chamber are up for grabs. Decision Desk predicts a 59.3 percent chance for a GOP majority. Scott, what Senate races should be we be watching as we go into 2024? So the two that I'm looking at, and I'll actually I'll give you three, Ohio, Montana, and Arizona. Okay. Arizona is interesting. We'll start with that one just because 
it could potentially be a three-way race between Kristen Cinema and the Democratic um, potential nominee, and it looks like potentially Carrie Lake on the Republican side if they make it all the way through. Um, you know, just three-way races, and especially in a state like Arizona where they take, you know, a long time to count the vote and there's all been all that turmoil around there, that one will be a tough one to call and will be very close. Uh, Montana, you have, you know, Senator John Tester, who is a Democrat in an extremely red state. Yeah. Um, and managed to keep on his seat last time. You know, he, he's got the incumbency. He's got the ability to win some of these real tough races. Um, and the Republicans may or may not choose the, the best candidate against them. They've got an open primary there, and there's some candidates there who the NRSC wants, and there's some candidates they don't want, and we'll see what, what happens there. And then Ohio, you have Sherrod Brown, who probably not as tough as, as John Tester, but certainly knows how to win in a red state and has that you know pedigree of a blue dog or uh, Democrat who can, who can fight for it. Now, Ohio is projected to go for Donald Trump as it did last time, um, so it'll be a tough state for him. But those are the three races um, that are going to be the toughest to call, and they're going to have tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars spent on them. Scott, one more for you before you go. A new poll from Redfield and Wilton Strategies shows 18% of voters are more likely to vote for a candidate endorsed by the one in only Taylor Swift. Could T. Swift <laughs> swing into this race? You know what? Could she? It wouldn't be the first time she's dipped her toes into politics. She has done voter drives, voter registration drives in the past. Um, and, you know, when she's done that, she's actually juiced um, voter registration. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know enough about Taylor Swift whether she get into it, but she is highly influential. I mean, what? It's two, three hundred dollars a ticket. She's selling out stadiums left and right all over the world, including the United States. There's, it's hard to say she's not going to have some sort of influence or at least have some sort of reach if she decides if she decides to take a position in, 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 the, in politics this cycle. Well, the question I'm asking is if she's going to make it in time from Tokyo to Las Vegas for the Super Bowl. I hope she does. I I, I like seeing her, seeing her on fo at football oh, I, games. I think the NFL wants her to be there for that one. <laughs> They'll make it happen, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, Scott, as always, thank you so much for all of your wisdom. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has been reviewing MDMA, along with therapy, as treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. MDMA-assisted therapy is on track for federal approval in 2024. And with more than 660,000 veterans under VA care known to suffer from PTSD, this approval can't come soon enough. Privately funded research has demonstrated clear, positive results in treating previously untreatable PTSD with little or no risk to patients. This includes studies in cooperation with the VA for existence at the Bronx VA Hospital. Let me be clear, these trials are conducted with full FDA approval under medical supervision and in a safe clinical environment. Joining us now is Juliana Mercer, a 16-year Marine Corps veteran who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Juliana is now the Director of Veteran Advocacy and Public Policy for Healing Breakthrough, a nonprofit helping vets with PTSD. Juliana, first of all, thank you so much for joining us and thank you uh, for your service to this country. You've advocated for these treatments on Capitol Hill and have testified in front of Congress. Where are we at with FDA approval at this moment? Uh, Lycos Therapeutics, formerly MAPS PBC, submitted a new drug application or NDA to the FDA this last December. Uh, the next milestone is 60 days later, which would be mid-February, and that is acceptance of the application. Um, with the breakthrough therapy designation that was given to MDMA in 2017, Lycos has requested that the FDA grant priority review of the NDA. Um, the FDA has 60 days to determine whether the NDA will be accepted for review and whether it will be a priority or standard review, so that's six months or 10 months respectively. If approved by the FDA, the DEA would then be required to reschedule MDMA, making it available for prescription medical use. So that's moving pretty fast, I mean, six to 10 months, but first walk us through MDMA specifically, and why is it so effective in treating PTSD, anxiety, and depression? Yeah, so MDMA causes a chemical reaction in the brain. For somebody that has post-traumatic stress disorder, they're stuck in their trauma response, which whether it's fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And MDMA goes in, it's kind of like a, 
a, a switch. It flips that switch off so that you're no longer stuck in that trauma response. And once that switch is off, you're able to confront your trauma without having that trigger. And you're able to work with a therapist to get to the root cause of the problem and sort through the trauma that you're dealing with. So you're a veteran yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about your own personal experience with your treatments? Yeah, so I found myself in a place uh, with no purpose and came across a nonprofit called Heroic Hearts Project. They're a nonprofit that takes veterans outside of the country to get psychedelic therapy in places where it's not illegal. Um, I was able to receive psychedelic assisted therapy and overnight almost uh, complete um, healing of 20 years of collected trauma and grief. And that was the answer that I was looking for, for my veteran brothers and sisters. And I felt like I needed to get this into as many hands of veterans as possible. And that's how I started uh, advocating for these therapies and am now focused on getting MDMA assisted therapy into the VA system. These therapies sound like they would certainly be a game changer as they were for you. But I think when some people hear the term psychedelics or MDMA, they think of ecstasy or Molly, but those things are absolutely not the, uh, not the same. Can you explain that? Yeah, so MDMA, uh, what will be prescribed in the hospital setting is a pharmaceutical. Um, ecstasy and Molly are street drugs. Um, so they do contain a form of MDMA, but they are often cut with other substances. So that makes them not clean and not a pure version of MDMA. And how concerned are you about the cost and access for this new treatment if it's ultimately approved? Uh, so there is concern. We want everyone to have access to this, which is why we think it's so important to focus on getting this treatment inside of the VA system. Um, veterans will be able to access it for free um, in their under their care at the VA. And outside in the community, we're looking at, at pretty high costs and it not being accessible to all. So I think that the VA will be a model for other healthcare systems to be able to provide this type of therapy and also hopefully down the line um, be able to um, implement it into insurance coverage. You know, we've talked about how this will be a game changer and how this could be approved in a matter of months to a year, but how urgent is the need for the Veterans Administration to embrace MDMA as a treatment method for our veterans? It's extremely urgent. Um, we are losing more veterans every year here at home than we did in the combined 20 years of combat on the global war on terrorism. That's 6,000 veterans every year here on American soil. We've been trying desperately to find solutions to the PTSD and suicide epidemic, and we've gotten nowhere because that number of 6,000 per year has not changed since 2005. And we have a solution that is 71% effective in eliminating the PTSD diagnosis. And we have to get access to our veterans as soon as it's FDA approved so that we can start saving veteran lives. So moving forward, do you think this could pave the way for other psychedelic substances to treat conditions outside of PTSD, anxiety, and depression? Absolutely. MDMA is the tip of the spear, and it's not a classic psychedelic, but there are close to 500 different psychedelic compounds that are currently being studied in some form of the FDA process. And they're looking at things like Alzheimer's, eating disorders, um, depressive disorders, and they're also looking at cluster headaches and, and pain management. So there's a lot of potential uses for these compounds. And I think MDMA is paving the way for uh, figuring out how to not only implement, but be open to these novel treatments. Juliana, you're really doing great work, and I hope this, um, you know, we'll, we'll see some progress in this world, in this uh, universe. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Julia. If you or anyone else you know is struggling from PTSD, anxiety, or depression, please call or text the number on this screen for more assistance. That's it for What's America Thinking. Come back next week.
I'm Julia Manchester, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And also, leave your comments and let us know what has you fired up in your region of the country.